awakening attention here and now, this constant refrain, because we keep forgetting the past, the future is so compelling <coughs> and habitual. And so like, like those of you who, who's going to be the next one to give a evening reflection? That's in the future, isn't it? Put it in a context of the way it is rather than, than uh, you know, just indulge in worry or resist it, trying to stop thinking about it. Just think right now, <coughs> this evening, what is this evening, Sunday evening, right now? It's possibility, isn't it? Perception, uh, but it's, and this is the way it is. <clears throat> so you can see that this is your way of using particular situations that is always centering you, bringing you, reminding you. Pachubana Dhamma, here and now Dhamma. <coughs> truth is the way it is right now, not as some kind of abstract truth you've got to find, uh, some, some subtlety that you haven't quite realized yet, but it's right in your face, it's here and now. <laughs> <clears throat> so this evening uh, you can spend the day relaxed because there isn't I will not invite anyone to give a reflection this evening <laughs> but still a perception is present isn't it this evening whether there's a day scenario or not and just reflect keep, keep examining this the way we propel ourselves into into this illusory time perception. How insidious uh, it is to to commit ourselves to the illusion of time as reality. <clears throat> of course the whole most of the world is doing it. You know, most human beings are thoroughly, totally committed to time as reality and themselves as their personalities. So, you, you know, you, you are going against the, the flow of very powerful conditioning, both personal and cultural, everywhere, not just, you know, every culture operates on that perception Then seeing the, how giving a, being asked if you've not been giving Dharma talks or, or even if you have but you still have not been involved with it in this particular community, this, this powerful sense of self-consciousness that arises. You know, just to, not, not to try to get rid of it but to really notice Oh, sitting up in front of everybody, you know, of course this is the ultimate uh, kind of experience of sticking your thumb out, sticking your neck out, like putting yourself in a vulnerable position as a person. <coughs> Where, you know, people are going to like or dislike what you're saying. And you find, oh, isn't that wonderful? We're so critical, you know. That was a really good talk, or that was a terrible talk. 
people, you know, have their own reaction. And, and then we, we project also. Somebody's looking grumpy and, and, uh, you know, he's sitting here and I look out and I see somebody looking really grumpy. I can think, they don't like what I'm saying. You know, I can take it, I can project onto them that it's me. Or they might just have a stomach ache. Or maybe they just look grumpy. Maybe they're very happy inside. They just have grumpy features. <laughs> so like uh, for me at this point, then of uh, training, I've been giving Dhammadasanas for so long that it, you know, there's no, doesn't arouse any trepidation. <coughs> but it certainly used to, you know, it's, it's, it's it is, uh, you know, it's a challenge to, and it brings up very strong sense of self-consciousness. If you can just fit into the crowd, just be one of a group, you know, it's nice just, just to be, you know, not to emphasize yourself in any way and be in a, in a group. It's kind of safe. You don't stand out. You're not putting yourself in any position that's dangerous. Safety in the herd. One sheep just looks like another. You know, they go and look at the sheep out in the pastures, and this one is Lucille, that one is Ellen. She's she's an introvert, and <laughs> that one has an anal fixation. <laughs> They just are like sheep, you know. We don't eat, we don't. <laughs> we can't even say sheeps. We just have a collective word. <laughs> Except the black sheep, isn't it? You. <laughs> which is a metaphor for what most of us feel like most of our lives. <clears throat> so this, this, the, this examining or just reflecting on the sense of being a person, you know, the self-consciousness is like this. You know, it's not a matter of getting rid of it, but recognizing it, seeing it as, as a condition that arises when, the, when other conditions are present. You know, there's no permanent self you know, in terms of personality or sakayaditi. You know, these are, these change. You know, we, you know, we can, you can see how you change depending on who you're with. If you're with your mother and father, or if you're best friend, or with somebody you don't like, or if you're in a position of responsibility, or if you're just one of the crowd, you know, like being work monk or work nun. And this, this, automatically the conditions are there for authority of some sort and work is not a perception generally that arouses happiness and joy in people's minds. But 
So then we can see uh, where the conditions that we are where if you work monk and work now and then then the, then how, what this does, you know, this this perception is like this. It's not a criticism of it or any way you should feel, but just notice what it brings up. I am responsible for getting the work done. And that's putting yourself out on, on a limb, isn't it? You're you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position that um, you know you're going to get a lot of, some resistance to it. Some people are, project all their fears of authority and that onto anyone who's in charge of the work. The discipline master. Or it'd be nice to be just the, the kind of agony aunt, you know, back in the crowd, you know, just patching up the feelings, the the hurt feelings of various people. <laughs> you know, people go to go to auntie when they're upset. Auntie sues you. That's a rather nice one. But to be the one that says, snap out of it, get to work, don't muck about. <laughs> but the conditions are different, aren't they? I mean, this is, uh, this is to reflect on this hitapanyata, how there is no permanent personality, you know, that, it, it, that you can find uh, in, in yourself. I can't find any permanent personality in myself. I was noticing yesterday with the Tanjau Kun Mitae, you know, forest, Tamayu Thai forest monk, immediately snap back into my Thai mode. <laughs> and because the conditions for that were there. Then when I go to we go back to the United States. I've been living in England for so long. <clears throat> but it takes a little time to get back into the American swing. But I mean, the conditions are there for that arouse those kind of perceptions and memories. But I think living here has the strongest influence because I've lived here longer than any other place. So, I mean, it's, it's noticing the power of the conditioning process, how conditions do affect, <coughs> you know, what affect the conscious experience. If you're in, if you have this sense of conviviality, you know, using this as a theme for this winter's retreat, conviviality, just taking that perception of friendliness, uh, joyfulness, friendship, rather than the perception of winter retreat, get, you know, really get your practice together, get samadhi, don't talk, avoid any situation where you have to, uh, you know, see everything that, that, where you have to communicate or participate in a group with some kind of obstruction, uh, and, Eat little, sleep little, speak little is another perception, you know, that has an effect on. So just, <coughs> you know, t changing from get get you know get your practice together to conviviality.
No, the other, the way of, you know, I, they used to describe the Vasa in the Theravada tradition, you know, as kind of a Buddhist Lenten period. So, I've been brought up as a Christian. Lent always mean the month where you, you have to give up something you really like. You know, so as a child, I used to give up sweets for the month of Lent. You give up something you really, you really like. And so I, and then I make this noble gesture, giving up sweets, and then all month long I'd be waiting for the end of it. <laughs> and when the end of Lent came, you know, then I was gobbling down sweets as many as I could get hold of. <laughs> So then seeing the Vasa, also like that, putting it in say, a kind of Buddhist Lent, three months longer, you know, Christian Lent's only one month, Buddhist Lent, three. Or seeing the winter's retreat as a kind of Lenten experience where you have to give up. Just noticing how we, you know, how we interpret various things, you know, how we, what we project onto the concepts, say, of this tradition from our own cultural way of thinking or char- personal characteristics. <clears throat> so since I have a strong Christian background, it's easy to project Christian things onto Buddhism. You know, the, the kind of cultural condition, basic cultural condition is highly influenced by Christianity. The work ethic, you know, the uh, hard work really pays off. You know, laziness gets you nowhere. You'll be nobody if you're just lazy, easygoing, convivial. If you're just enjoying this winter's retreat, you know, just having a good time, that means you're not really working hard enough. You're never going to get anywhere. You'll never reach Nibbana. You'll go around smiling and being polite and nice and enjoying everything is, uh, you know, that doesn't pay off in the way that hard work does. Patient endurance, I don't know, like this, so the voices can, and this is like this is the general structure of, you know, perceptual structure that, that I've had to live with. It's a strong sense of working hard giving up everything uh, that somehow going into the cafe and drinking a cup of coffee is wasting time there's an exam (laughs) and I'm just wasting my time so then in with reflection, then I could see this. I can get behind all that if I'm willing to really notice, not just let it intimidate me endlessly or just uh, suppress it, but to know it's like this, the feeling of having to do something. I should be doing something. There's something I've got to do, something that I have to accomplish, achieve, Three months winter's retreat, you know, the lay support group come and they, they do all this support work, make it possible for us to, to really get, get down to real practice, you know, and then we can, uh, uh, and so have I been really, have I really gotten down to real practice during these three months? Or have I just wasted the time by convivial, being convivial? I mean, these are, I don't know how these, you know, this, this resonates with you, but this, this could be the, the kind of inner tyrants that speak. And you listen to them, get to know them. They're like, they're, they are, they are the way they are. 
It's all, that's the knowing rather than, than uh, the judging. When you judge them, oh, I shouldn't, or I should, and then it should be or it shouldn't be, then, then you're making more of it than what it is. You're, you're creating, you're putting something on top of the present perception. It's, it's something you, you fix onto it. You compound it. You make, make it gets complicated. So then, the sense of the beginner's mind, isn't it? Back to, because it's always present here and now. Tomorrow is the unknown. This evening. What if I suddenly decide in mealtime, well, I think we should have somebody give a talk. <laughs> I've got complete power to change it, you know, on a whim, don't I? You, I've either usurp that power or you've given to me. I don't know which yet. So then prior to thought, this is, this is my, you know, the thing that has driven me in this life is, uh, the one thing I really aimed at and interested in was the realization of unconditioned, of the unconditioned. So that's the thing that it has, I haven't had been a strong community type person. You know, like some monks, some people join the Sangha because they want to live in a community or they have a strong sense of communal, you know, relationships and things like this. I, I, I didn't really. That was not at all a conscious thing in my mind when I became a monk. Was was The community was more or less a side product that I put up with. <laughs> but the... <laughs> But the, uh, but the aim was this, you know, breaking through, getting out of this incessant thinking, obsessive, uh, mind, conditioning of the mind. It's such a ranting, tyrannical way of living, you know, the inner jackal, the inner tyrant. They just, Relentless. So then, uh, it's just it's, it's trying to stop it, trying to get out, and also a strong faith, a sense of, you know, an intuition of the unconditioned has always been present from, you know, from my early years as Christian, God and that sense of something more than just the so there's something behind all this. A reality that, that you can't get hold of. So then, uh, having the opportunity to Ordained to take Upasambada train as a Buddhist monk, the whole, you know, the doing, uh, going through, learning the, the tradition, the Dhamma Vinaya and so forth. I can, I can, I, I can put up with any of it, you know, from very strict to whatever, 
because that's not what I'm really interested in in terms of the the form and the and that the interest was solely on this realization. So I've never felt, you know, I could live in very strict Vinaya monasteries. I can. It doesn't bother me to to uh, the, these kind of details around the the lifestyle because the 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 direction was very always very clear. I could put up with with the idiosyncratic things of various teachers or or ways of holding tradition. Because that wasn't, I didn't, you know, I, I, I just wasn't interested enough in it to try to, to, uh, you know, to endlessly try to put my mind on trying to improve everything or make it more this or less that. Because the, the, the one pointedness was very strong. So that, you know, I will say I, it did make me sometimes quite insensitive as, uh, to communal life. Mm-hmm. Oh, I paid the price for that also. <laughs> <laughs> but this reflection on, 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 the, you know, the way it is, Keep learning. Now I feel, you know, that it's more balanced. That the community is a part of it. You know, the whole thing works. It's the way it is. The conditions are like this. It's not just me. I'm just not a, you know, this one monk that and, you know, one way trip to Nibbana, that's all I care about. Get me there as soon as possible. And if you can't keep up with me, tough luck. Because <laughs> that didn't work either. No, you know, the, the, whatever way we hold or perceive, you know, what is before that? Any assumption we make about ourselves or the world or time before that? Those are, those are conditions, sankharas that arise according to other conditions. What is the, what is sustained? What is present here and now before anything arises or ceases? And this is the, the conundrum of the holy life isn't it? before you become a person so you have to stop thinking isn't it and this is where pointing to this this uh, the gaps the sound of silence the gaps between words, pointing to space and to consciousness, isn't it? This is this is where we stop thinking. <clears throat> because if we just try to think our way around Buddhism, then it's it's still a nice thing to think about. It's not to I'm not putting that down. Buddhism itself is a perception that I really like. I like, I like the idea of Buddha. You know, so the perception of Buddha, Buddhism. I like being a Buddhist. I've never been one of those people that, that you know, I don't, you know, didn't want to identify. I always loved the, 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 I always liked considering myself a Buddhist. That's never been a perception that I found difficult. 
in some Westerners mind, I don't want to be a Buddhist or a Christian or anything, because they see religion always as some kind of divisive identity. So this exploration, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, and it has, to, it's like a, you know, you have to keep at it because it's so easy to be propelled back into, into all the assumptions, conditioning, personal habits, intimidations from the Sangha, uh, you know, all the kind of ways that, that our personality arises. You know, personal relationships and, and, uh, positions in the Sangha, identities being work monk, work nun, or abbot, or head nun, or all these kind of things, they get, these easily kind of take us over, you know, easily lost in trying to fulfill, live up to roles, becoming something. So, I mean, it, this, uh, if we don't, if we don't Recognize the, that point right here and now before you become, before I become abbot. Then I, this is where I point to the sound of silence because that's very useful in, in stopping the proliferating tendencies, you know, just you know, you get the idea, you grasp the idea, you think it's all very good teaching, say, you know, but then you think of it, keep thinking about it, you just go round and round to get weary of thinking about it. There's beginning, you know, this awakening, awakening to that place prior to becoming, where, what is that, you know, in terms of reality here and now? So then in this, Reflections in the in the morning, and it is pointing to this uh, continuous. This is my intention. The breath is here and now. The body, as a as experienced, not as a personal identity. The body, the posture, the sensations in the body that you're that are arising in consciousness now. And exploring this in terms of anicca, you know, anicca to kanata, not as projections of those concepts onto anything, but, you know, you keep, one, if you keep at it, you keep breaking down the, the habitual tendencies that we have to, you know, that are so culturally ingrained in us, the assumptions we make, endless assumptions about life, about ourselves and the world that we live in, that this three characteristics that Anicca Dukkanata are skillful means to to really break through, you know, the the way we we uh, the force of habit, the assumptions, the cultural conditioning that we have that we can easily dominate our experience at any given moment. So this is getting this perspective, a space, or infinity. Consciousness, infinite consciousness, infinite space. Neither perception or non-perception. That used to baffle me, that one. The immeasurable. Try to figure that one out. Try to figure neither perception or (laughs) non-perception. Through thinking about it. Get myself into a real intellectual muddle over that one. When I try to think about it. 
<clears throat> so exploring this then the the uh then the you know thinking is not the means anymore Bariyati dhamma has its value but they have to let go of it after a while to the awareness before you think consciousness that that thought arises in or the awareness like in, in emptiness isn't it in emptiness you're conscious but you, you don't necessarily have to be thinking in it consciousness and thought are not bound in you know they're not together thought arises in consciousness and ceases So just is a you develop this awareness, this resting in the silence, the inner stillness, no thought, but conscious. So this is just a reflection of the reality of this. Like I'm not con- trying to convince you. I'm just reflecting for myself at this moment. Um, in, uh, notice the sound of silence. So, like, I'm right on the edge. You know, I'm on really just completely open, awake to the this vibration. Then reflecting, no thought is a. I think, I'm thinking, but it's not wandering thinking, is it? I think, I, I reflect, inwardly reflect, no thinking is like this. So that, just informing the thinking processes and being used to point rather than to just analyze and figure it out and understand it through uh, intellectual ability. So this kind of knowledge then is a direct knowing. You know, it's a, it's a, where what we generally, what you get through education usually is uh, knowing about things, the various opinions, views, the authorities, the experts, what others write and what others produce and modern science and philosophy and so forth as we learn about what what the greats of the past produced or what is happening now without knowing the reality of this moment. We can live in totally kind of abstract world as you find in in the universities. So then the, the gaps, this, this, this between thoughts, you know, I had to spend, I spent several years, two years almost constantly, our practice of observing the gaps between my thoughts. Because even though I could understand the, the, the value, I had the insight into the value of that, and the, benefits from practicing it, it it's uh, you know the, the strong tendency to proliferate I'm a great papancha type person conceptual proliferator extraordinaire I can I'm very good at making mountains out of molehills <laughs> So this, this, uh, you know, I'm a kind of magician, in fact, I think. You know. 
I could make a mountain out of a molehill in, in, in a couple of, in a second, you know. Something trivial and minute suddenly over, becomes gigantic over, just in a, in a couple of seconds. Now this is, uh, you know, how, but then the importance that I felt and the insight into noticing because this, this awareness has a continuity. You know, thinking moves very rapidly. So you can't get really hold of thoughts very well. They, they just, they rise and cease so quickly. So then, I deliberately think I am a human being, some kind of banal and uninspired thing. You know, I didn't want it to be a kind of fascinating or or a depressing thought. I mean, there's some kind of thing that doesn't, you know, neutral kind of thing that is, doesn't create any strong emotion. So, this is, I'd say, I. There's a gap. But they're interested in the gap, not in the, in the, in the, in the I. Not at all interested in the eye, let's say this perfunctory eye, eye. But the gap. Um, the, the, the intention is toward the space, the gap, rather than giving a lot of interest in the thoughts, the words that arise. Well, from this, you know, just be, you know, by continuously pursuing this and a, a strong sense of emptiness develop. Because if, you know, just thinking about it, it, it doesn't, you know, I could, I could understand it and, and appreciate it on that level also. But it's still, the same problem was always present, you know. The obsessive thinking mind. So this learning to slow it down, to stop, to notice non-thought, space, emptiness, the gap between words, the cessation, like emotional state, learning to, like the, the energy that lingers around emotion, strong emotions, Learning to hold that, to allow that, till it ceases. Niroda satya. And you can only do that through just trusting in this awareness. Where you can bear with something that maybe you, you've never had to bear before. You know, you've never really, uh, you, uh, you know, and this kind of insight, you know, most of us just always going from one thing to another. Just always, you know, seeking distraction, you know, when this thing gets a bit boring or that, then you find the next interesting thing to do. Something, you know, eat something or read something or or just, if, you know, if there's nothing to do and, and the, you know, and you're bored, then go to sleep. Crash out. So, I mean, you can, because this, is, this seems unbearable, isn't it? Boredom. Not knowing doubt, boredom, um, despair, anguish, old age. This, this side of the spectrum. Old age, sickness, and death. Grief, despair, despair, anguish, lamentation. Ugh, can't bear them. <clears throat> can't bear those kind of things. So get on to the next one. Snap out of it, you know. Life is a banquet. And most of the suckers are starving to death. <laughs> so we got to just seek an endless, you know, possibility of, of uh, banqueting 
distracting, exciting experiences, romantic, romance and adventure. So and then, so during this retreat, you know, this 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 attitude towards boredom, towards despair. This, that's why I include this the sense of welcoming it. I find this very helpful to me because I don't, you know, usually in my reaction is not to want it. I think there's something wrong. If I'm feeling despair, and there's something wrong, and, and I've got to just get rid of it in some way by doing something or thinking something or, or annihilating it in some way rather than allowing, welcoming. Condition phenomena is the way it is. And, you know, when you get down to reasoning about it, you know, at this moment, this moment can only be like this. You know, it's, it's, it's really stupid, isn't it? That I don't want this moment to be like this. <laughs> because this moment right now can only be like this. That's the way it is. You know, whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant one is an issue. It's like this. I don't want it to be like this. <laughs> and then we, you know, then we create the suffering. Why can't every moment just be a moment of bliss and peace and communal harmony and love? And why can't it all be like that? Why do they have to have these moments that are filled with strife, despair, grief, anguish, doubt, boredom? Anger. I don't want those moments. I want only the, you know, I want only beautiful yellow, fresh daffodils. And I don't like them when they go, when they start wilting and shriveling up. Just want life to be one long succession of beautiful, fresh, yellow daffodils. Then you get bored with them. Fed up with daffodils. (laughs) (laughs) So it's the conundrum. It's questioning what is before I am, I become. What is, what is it now before I am Ajahn Tomato? You know, so this is like a question, doesn't it? Questioning, self-inquiry. It stops, when you ask yourself a question, then you really, it stops the, this, the, the conceptual proliferation, the papancha. So you, like, who am I? This, this Advaita question. Who am I? Or what, what, what is, what was my original face? The Zen koan. Or the, what is the, my original face before I was born? Or, what is before I become something? So that's a, like a, a non-plussing of the mind, isn't it? You're stopping the thinking mind. And there's a blank. You don't notice that, that when you ask yourself a question, like a unsolvable riddle, you know, the question, there's a, it's like this. The, you hesitate, there's hesitation, there's, the thinking mind stops for a moment. And you notice that, you're really aware of that, begin to really, uh, you know, <clears throat> seek that, practice with it, so that more and more you, 
You trust it. Not in, your, in all your, your desires to find answers to every question, solve every riddle, but, but your willingness, allowing yourself to be in a state of, of awareness, not knowing everything. Just this open attention, awakened attention, where all possibilities can arise, but you don't know what's going to happen, what the future will bring. So then cultivating this emptiness is uh, the text determination and patient endure because it you know it's emotionally you know it's so boring emptiness you know here I've spent 35 years of my life seeking nothing end up with nothing and in a worldly terms, that sounds really depressing, doesn't it? You know, in worldly terms. But in Dhamma terms, that's, that's what I've been after. That's the whole point. That's the whole direction. To end up at the end of my life with nothing. No self. No attachment. Freedom. Now, these, just sharing these kind of <clears throat> ways that I've done it is all I can do. And you, you, you know, you're capable of developing things that that really, you know, work for you. So, this is learning to trust yourself in your own ability to use skillful means, upayas that work. But in, in any of this, when you're, de- when you're, when you're, you know, when the practice is towards this Pachubhanadhamma here and now, then anything that, that helps you to remember now, and learning to really appreciate this sense of just pure presence, like this, And then I can, I can, like I'm holding it, this is sustaining this sense of pure presence, kind of relishing it, loving it. So that you, you know, more and more, you, 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 the emotional your emotional habits can be reflected in it. So you can let go. You're not just caught in being bored. Because as you try to hold that, and you know, you, try, you grasp the idea of it, it easily goes into grasping again. I've got to be present all the time. Pure presence. And you start making it into, a, you know, a kind of determination. You know, I've got to cultivate and develop, practice pure presence all the time, every moment of the day and night. And then it becomes heavy business again. You know, so it becomes, I've got to do it, you know. I can't sit there in the common room and be convivial because I lose it all the time, you know. I'm talking about things sometimes, you know, not real dumb or anything. And then, uh, and then uh, it's just, uh, 
You know, how can you be pure presence and you're getting wound up by these monks, Samaneras, Anagarikas, and all that? Can't waste my time with, with that. Got to really, you know, get into this pure presence dedicated totally 24 hours a day. That's heavy. That's a heavy number. You become, you know, the inner tyrant is taken over already. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's, it's conviviality then is, is a, you know, it's, it's light. It's friendly. It's allowing. It's welcoming. And it, it helps us to relax. You know, you can't, you can't really sustain awareness through increasing the tension. Too much effort, you know, is, is, uh, you just become more and more contracted. Tense. So you, you 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 you're reflecting on what is it? Well, I feel a sense of well-being, ease, relaxing, open, receptivity. Beginning to recognize that and notice it, note it, and then. And as we turn to each other, then more and more we can open to each other in that way, a sense of receptivity rather than of reaction, projection. <clears throat> so, you, so much of what we call <clears throat> personal relationships are just projections and reactions. Rather than, than receiving welcoming and so this, this concept of conviviality has this sense of, of receiving of welcoming friendliness happiness as a way of relating to this present moment since I've seen this present moment in terms of welcoming and whatever comes in this present moment, internally or externally, welcoming, receiving. And this welcoming is a relaxed welcoming. It's not dutiful kind of, oh, welcome. So good to see you. I've got an appointment right now. Could I? <laughs> but a real sense of, of presence and openness. These are, these are words that convey this, this, uh, this beauty of the present, of being, being that in the present, rather than somebody who's trying to get it by working hard at your practice. So then, to me, the the path very much is uh, is this what, what you might like pawana in the fourth noble truth. Pawana is the word, the Pali word, cultivating or developing this awareness, this emptiness. So every moment that you realize emptiness is the path. You know, it's not like I've got to find the path, the eightfold path in some way. 
is how I regard it. Every moment is, a, is in that I really allow this emptiness, this openness. Path is like this. The fourth noble truth. It's as simple as that, other than Sammaditi, Sammasangapona. <laughs> it gets increasingly more complicated. I mean, that's involved in it, but it is, but in your simplifying it to, to uh, an intuitive reality rather than this conceptual thing with eightfold path and all this, and endless commentaries on these words, Sammaditi, Sammasangapona, Sammayamo, Sammasamadi, and all that. And you, your mind goes buzzing around, trying to get the right English translations for all those Pali words. And you spend the rest of your life trying to perfect the proper, get the proper, perfect equivalents in English for those Pali words. And at the end of the day, die in fear and trembling. Great contribution to Buddhist academia, though. <laughs> Which is better than, you know, living your life in some other way, probably. But, but the pathetic thing is that the, the power of this teaching, you know, how direct and how very few Buddhists ever do it. <laughs> you know, or even to realize what, you know, the, the, the gift that they, that's right in front of them, you know, that the opportunity that's right, right in front of you, completely overlooked. Oh, I'd rather be, a, you know, an engineer. <laughs> People think I'd rather be a doctor or an engineer or you know, it sounds so, you know, and what, you know, this idea of worldly values. I mean, we're so stuck in such a materialistic society here. And it, uh, we, and it affects us very strongly. But it, it, remember, it is a very limited view of everything that we have as a culture. You know, and it's heavy. It lacks real elegance and beauty because it's so materialistic. It's just so gross, really. You know, and making lots of, lots of money. You know, getting lots of it. Being able to get all the goodies that are being offered endlessly. You know, titillate us endlessly with the advertisements about the latest, uh, the new model, the best. It's gross and it's really vulgar and, and kind of disgusting culture that, we're, that we've degenerated into in the West. Then to talk, you know, sitting there talking to people who are engineers that can't get work. Yesterday, people come up and they're qualified engineers and they can't get a job. Why well, you spend your life, you know, trying to attain these worldly aims, values, and so this pawana the. the the fourth noble truth. In Thai, they use pawana as meditation. It's a synonym, synonymous to meditation. Dana sila pawana. And, and that's the insight into the fourth noble truth, isn't it? There is the eightfold path, the way of liberation, the way of non suffering. You should pawana. You should they use it, develop or cultivate this. And then the third insight: this, this has been this has been achieved. 
which has been cultivated or developed. So um, this 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 idea of the three aspects of each noble truth, the the, uh, the statement, the prescription, and the result. Well, this, then the result, the body waiting, is like this. And only I can know that result. I can't know the result for you. In my, in the, my own experience, it's like this. The result, non-suffering, is like this. And that, then that I know, when I can, you know, that this is the path. Definitely. So you, you know when you're, when you create suffering and then caught up in all your things and when there's no suffering is like this. Suffering is like this. Non, non-suffering is like this. Compared, if I start becoming Ajahn Sumedho and get intimidated and carried away on that, I suffer. It's complicated. It's not easy being Ajahn Sumedho and being this personality. It gets, it's so convoluted and complicated and fraught with all kinds of things. Anything gets triggered off. So then the stability of the present moment, Ajahn Sumato rises, ceases. This non-suffering is like this. This is the path, the way of non-suffering. So this, just to affirm that, to really mentally note that this is the way it is. This is not just your, your intellect creating some illusion about you're not suffering. Really have the guts to notice non-suffering is like this. You know, in the sense of presence, openness, relaxed attention. You know, I'm with everything. I'm holding this. I, everything belongs. I'm not asking for favors or conditions to change. It's the way it is right now. And it, everything belongs. And non-suffering is like this. So I'll leave you with that to reflect on for the day. <laughs>